Uh, joining me today is award-winning journalist, author, playwright, screenwriter, co-author of the book, the, of the book the CIA does not want you to read, and that is Jawbreaker. He's also written inside, he's co-authored inside SEAL Team 6, and many, many other great works such as Eve Missing, Blood of My Blood, Plunging into Haiti, and like I said, many more great titles, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, joining me now, please join me in welcoming Ralph Pizzullo to the program. Hello, Ralph. How are you doing today? I, I'm good, Bruce. Thanks great for having to have me on. You on. Pleasure. Yeah. It's great to have you on, Ralph. Thank you so much. Now, um, being originally from New York City, how, how difficult is it for you to watch the footage of 9-11 as of late, uh, you know, regarding, you know, the botched up operations, you know, all these people responsible, you know, that we hear them aiding and abetting the same enemy in Syria. How, how difficult is it, has it been for you to see this, this footage as of well, late? I was uh, I was actually living in New York uh, when 9/11 happened. Uh, you know, uh, I was I was living on 111th Street, and mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it, it was a very very painful day, uh, shocking. Uh, you know, I knew people who died in, in the tragedy, and you know, many many more people that were affected by it, and. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, being a resident of Manhattan at that time, uh, all of us were in shock for about three months. Uh, it took, it was, it wasn't until sort of January, you know, 2002 that things started to, to anything started to happen. Uh, That's right. you know, nobody was really doing anything. I, I was, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a very, very difficult time, horrible time. I can imagine, Ralph. I mean, it's. I think it's safe to say most New Yorkers had a have had a sick feeling in their guts this whole week. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it was. Uh, it was just. Uh, you know, my. I remember I was on my way to my office and I uh, went to say goodbye to my like two year old daughter. She was in front of the TV, uh -huh. and I thought she was watching Sesame Street. And I mm -hmm. saw that there was a. Uh, 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 an image, a mm -hmm. silent image of one of the towers uh, on fire, and uh, I thought, "What the heck is this? Is right. is this the anniversary of the first attack on the World Trade Center?" Right. And there was no, there was no, uh, there was no sound. There was no commentary, and so I was looking at it, wondering, like, wh why, you know, what's going on? Why isn't you watching Sesame Street? And suddenly I heard a voice say, oh, my God, here comes another plane. And wow. I saw uh, I saw the, the second plane, you know, strike. And uh, that that minute, you know, that moment, I, I knew that, uh, you know, our history had changed, was changing. And this was going to have, like, a, an enormous impact on all of our lives, which is, you know, which is what has happened. Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I can I can remember I was a, a sophomore. I was in 10th grade and, you know, the Internet was relatively new back then. And, you know, they shut down all communications. The school was yeah. on lo on lockdown. And, wow. you know, I, I thought it was weird. I mean, I couldn't even turn on. I mean, the Internet, like I said, was relatively new. I was in my math class at the time and the teacher usually let us go online and this this time he, he didn't. He was like, no, nope, no Internet, no radio, no TV, no nothing. So I thought that was weird. And then yeah. getting getting home, I, I got home and I saw what was going on. And I literally thought the world was ending. I mean, I'm, I was a young guy back then, but I thought, yeah. oh, wow, this is this is it. We're finished. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, I had, fr you know, friends in this you know, sort of security uh, uh, section of the, of the government or working right. for the RAND Corporation and so on, mm -hmm. you know, who had been talking about for years how, you know, the security of the borders was not, you know, we, we were pretty lax about security, and right. we didn't realize that, uh, you know, that, that, the th that, that there was a threat that could, that could reach American soil, and, uh, you know, nobody paid much attention to them. And then, you know, 9-11 happened and, you know, <laughs> wow, it was profound. profound. Absolutely. And, and we're still, I think, kind of, uh, 
you know, still trying to come to terms with that in, in many ways. We are. We are. Yeah. Well, Ralph, um, moving on, uh, you moved to L.A. In, in 2004, I believe, after yeah. writing almost about about almost everything, as you put it, in particular your, your mystery novel, Eve Missing. Uh, tell yeah. us about that novel and what it's been like to work with Hollywood icons like Oliver Stone, one of my personal favorite. I mean, he's one of the absolute best directors ever. And Antoine yeah. Fakla, among others. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, it's been, uh, you know, uh, I, I started really as a journalist. And then uh, I became interested in theater. And while I was in New York, I wrote, you know, plays. I wrote about, you know, 12 to 14 plays that were produced in New York and other cities around the country. And a few of them were per, uh, performed overseas. And then in, uh, and I had done some work uh, for movies. And I decided in, two, you know, late 2003 to move my family to Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, we fell in love with Southern California right away. It's, you know, so right. beautiful and so on. And, and, you know, around that time I wrote, uh, as you mentioned, Eve Missing, which was a mystery novel. Uh, it's, it's, it's a story of, uh, of a New York City policeman who is uh, sort of wrongfully accused of uh, uh, a violent incident that, that takes place while he and his partner are breaking up a domestic dispute. And he's sort of railroaded out of the the, LA, uh, the the New York Police Department, mm -hmm. and he becomes a he, and the thing he liked about being a policeman the most was was helping other people. So he decides he's going to become a, a private investigator, and the first case that he takes on is of a of a girl who has gone missing. Uh, she's a young fashion model. And he, he, he sort of delves into this world of high fashion, which, you know, he is, is completely foreign to him. And uh, fall, ends up falling in love with a woman he, he meets uh, who was kind of Eve's mentor. And then sort of halfway through, he realizes that this woman had something to do with Eve's disappearance. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a pretty intense... Uh, steamy uh you know uh, <laughs> mystery novel and uh and it, it was great for me because uh you know the mystery writing community is kind of a a a, a, a small fraternity mm -hmm. a small group and, and i got to meet a lot of uh you know fellow authors and uh awesome and you know and make a lot of friends and then you know coming to coming to hollywood i found it to be uh you know, quite receptive to, uh, you know, to new talent arriving in, in California. And I, and I got a chance to work, as you mentioned, with, uh, you know, some really talented people, including Oliver Stone, who uh, wanted to make Jawbreaker, uh, which is a book I wrote with uh, CIA operative Gary Bernson, That's into right. a movie. And we came very close. Uh, it was, you know, great working with him. I, I you know, I... Mm -hmm. was a, I'm a huge fan of his uh, of his movies, especially his earlier movies. And uh, you know, it didn't work out. Uh, Hollywood is a crazy place. Uh, <laughs> lots well, of you know uh, it. Yeah, lots of uh, you know twists and turns. But a lot of red know, tape, right? A lot yeah, of red huge tape. red tape. Yeah, you're dealing with a lot of people who are uh, you know making decisions who. You know, I'm I'm somebody who is as a writer. I I am uh, just interested in the material and how to Absolutely. tell the story and tell the story the best way. And a lot of people out here, you know, they could, you know, the material to them is not important. They're not even, you know, they don't even particularly read it. Uh, you know, they're just interested in other things, which are, you know, how they're going to market it and. Exactly. how it's going to fit into their slate of movies and so on and so forth. You know, things that are, uh, you know, important, but I, you know, were not important to me. And, you know, anyway, it, right. it didn't work out. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate, Ralph. I mean, I could imagine, yeah. though, I mean, Jawbreaker is definitely not their cup of tea. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't. No. no, I mean, I remember turning in a draft to Paramount 
and going there to get, you know, notes. And uh, some people said, well, gee, you know, uh, they don't kill bin Osama bin Laden at the end. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, he got away. That's the whole point. And they're like, well, that, you know, you, they, you know we're going to have to change that because, uh, you know, that's too much of a downer, you know, for, right. for the end of a movie. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, uh, this is history. This is what happened. And, I, 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 you know, it's a shame it wasn't made into a movie because, you know, I think it's a very important story. And had, uh, and you know, I tried to explain this to them at the time, and had we killed bin, Osama bin Laden in Tora Bora, which is what the CIA and Gary, what they were trying to do, uh, it would have been very difficult for the United States to justify going into Iraq and continuing the war in Afghanistan, you know, the way we have. So right. I think it would have made, like, a big, big uh, difference. And, uh, you know, it was an impo- important historical moment, you know, that was an opportunity that was missed. And, and had it, you know, had they been successful, it would have, it would have changed, uh, you know, changed history. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. That's very, very unfortunate. But, um, you know, we, we, we have to keep talking about Jawbreaker. I mean, it's a book that's been very essential in my waking up. I mean, I, I love uh, reading it. I mean, I feel like I'm right there in a, in a helicopter about to deploy in Afghanistan <laughs> when I'm reading it. I mean, yeah. it's a book that, like you said, you co-authored with former CIA commander Gary Bernstein, uh, Jawbreaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's what's Jawbreaker code for? Jawbreaker, you know, as you know, uh, Bruce, what happened after 9-11, uh, President Bush, it, it became obvious right away that, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden and his, his, his and al-Qaeda was operating out of Afghanistan, and they were being protected by, they were given safe haven by the Taliban, which was right. in control of Afghanistan at the time. And immediately, uh, you know, President Bush made a, a statement saying, you know, uh, asking the Tal- you know, demanding that the Taliban, you know, kick him out of Afghanistan or turn him over to the United States. And the Taliban said, of course, you know, f- you know, go to hell, basically. <laughs> and, Piss uh, off. Yeah, yeah, that's not going to happen. And uh, so, so the president wanted to do something to 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 retaliate, and he went to the Defense Department uh, and said, you know, I want to send troops into Afghanistan. And the answer he got from the Defense Department was, well, we need six months to plan something because, you know, Afghanistan is a land landlocked country. It's very difficult geographically. You know, the Soviet Union's got their butts kicked there. Uh, You know, we have to do a lot of, you know, planning, logistical planning before we can do anything. And the president was very frustrated, and uh, everybody in the government knew that, and a a group of CIA officers came up with this idea that 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 they took to the president, and it was basically that, you know, they had been, they had had operatives in Afghanistan, working with the with the opposition to the Taliban, which was called the Northern Alliance, there were a group of tribes uh, organized under uh, Commander Massoud uh, in in the north, um, and the CIA, some CIA officers, including Gary Bernson, had been working with these guys before, and so what the CIA proposed is that they organize a group of teams send them into Afghanistan to just sort of work with the Northern Alliance and kind of prepare for the U.S. military to, you know, for the U.S. military in, in incursion into Afghanistan. Right. So, so the man that they, that they decided they, they needed somebody who was, you know, spoke the language, was familiar with Afghanistan, had a relationship with the Northern Alliance, and the man that they decided to bring in was named Gary Bernson. The, who you mentioned, the, the gentleman that I wrote the book with. And Gary at the time was the CIA station chief in Montevideo, Uruguay. Uh, they called him up to, he also happened to be a New Yorker. He had, he had been born, in, born in, and raised in, in Long Island. So they called Gary up to CIA headquarters in Langley, 
and said, uh, hey, this is what we want you to do. We want you to organize a group of teams that we're going to send into Afghanistan with a small group of special forces people. And you're going to just kind of start to prepare for the U.S. Uh, military incursion that's going to come later. And so Gary goes to work, and Gary is like a very, very aggressive type of guy. Right. Uh, a guy who, you know, you ask him to do something, and he does it, no matter what it is, and no matter, you know, how many heads he has to crack, you know, to get it done. And so he immediately starts, you know, scouring the government for people who were uh, native speakers, who had some experience in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, interestingly, he, he, he got a lot of resistance, even though this is like weeks after 9-11. There was a lot of resistance from people in the bureaucracy, even in the CIA, guys saying, hey, I, we don't want you to take our officer because he's probably going to get killed anyway, and uh, wow. you know, who are you and what is... Anyway, he puts these teams together, and uh, the, the main team was called Jawbreaker, and uh, that was the team that he was running. And they were in the Panchir Valley, which was just north of Kabul. Uh, and, and then there were uh, about seven other teams that were scattered across the, around the country working with different pockets of, 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 of tribes who were you know, uh, uh, fighting the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gary goes in. Uh, he's got a Rubbermaid trunk. I mean, we... Uh, one thing we should explain is that Jawbreaker was pretty heavily redacted by the U.S. government. That's so, right. So uh, there were a lot of things I had to take. We had to take out of the book. One of the things we had to take out was the fact that Gary went into Afghanistan with eleven million dollars in cash in a Rubbermaid trunk. So he goes in. He's helicoptered in with a small group of guys. His team was about uh, twenty people. Uh, about 10 CIA officers and 10 special forces guys. They go in and they start working with the Northern Alliance. And immediately Gary starts getting like very aggressive. So what he does is he, he starts getting satellite phone numbers of the Taliban commanders because, you know, Afghanistan, to understand Afghanistan, Afghanistan is a tribal country. And, it, it, it's a country that's ruled by warlords. And so alliances are shifting all the time. That's right. And Gary, being a student of Afghanistan and having been there before, he understood that. And what he did is he just started, he started getting like the, the phone numbers of, of guys who were fighting for the Taliban. And he'd call them up. And he'd say, hey, uh, you know, Shah Muhammad or whatever your name is, I'm Gary Burnson. I'm going to come here and I'm coming to kick your ass. And if you don't, <laughs> I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an option. I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars right now to come over to my side and fight for me. Or I'm going to call, I know your position. I'm going to call in airstrikes and you're going to get wow. wiped out tomorrow. And one of the things that Gary, that the special forces brought with them were these things called so flams which are uh, special forces, uh, I forget the, what the whole acronym me means, but it's, they're laser markers, and basically it's, it's like a, a rifle that you could point at a target, and it emits a laser beam that you can, you can that for, for, for accurately for three miles. Mm -hmm. And that, once that beam hits a, fits, fix, fixes on a target, an aircraft or a, you know, like a B-52 flying over it, uh, 30,000 feet can drop a bomb that will lock immediate that lock right onto that laser designator and hit that spot, you know, directly. Right. So those, they, those proved to be like in, incredibly important. And so when Gary made these threats to these commanders, they were like, you know, okay, uh, I'll take the hundred thousand dollars right uh, away, but I, I'll take it, man. <laughs> but, I've got like 20 Al Qaeda guys with me. Like, what do I do about them? And Gary would say, I'll kill them. Just shoot them. And they'd go, okay, we'll wait for you. At, and Gary would say, okay, we'll wait for you at this spot at like, you know, noon tomorrow. 
and they'd go to a certain spot in the pantry or valley and they'd hear you know they'd hear machine gun fire which was you know these guys shooting the al qaeda people and right. then they they'd walk over the the line to the other side and they'd fight for gary in the northern alliance so wow. within what happened is that within 3 weeks gary had built up like such a big force and the soflams were so effective combined with us airstrikes that they were able to over, to, to, to get the taliban lines to break that were guarding Kabul, which is the capital, and they took over the capital city. And I think, you know, Vice President Cheney was having a news conference at the time, and some reporter from CNN said, uh, hey, did you know that Kabul has fallen and, and there are Americans there? And he was like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And they showed him some footage of a bunch of Americans getting off of a helicopter, and one of them was Gary Burnson. So, uh, so nobody thought that these guys, Gary's teams, were gonna were gonna, uh, uh, you know, have any success. In fact, uh -huh. they were telling the president that they figured, you know, they had a fifty fifty. There was a fifty fifty chance that they'd all get killed. And uh, but anyway, you know, they were successful beyond anybody's imagination. And you know, within three weeks, they 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 had taken over. They had kicked it the Taliban at a Kabul. The Taliban had retreated, had retreated south with their, you know, the, the people, the, the Al Qaeda fighters that they had. Right. And then Gary was, he wanted Osama bin Laden. He had, he had told his superiors at the CIA before he left that he was going to come back with Osama bin Laden's head in a box. And, wow. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's a, he's a pretty intense guy. And so, uh, uh, he, he goes to his, he, he, he's, he was working. The Northern Alliance had good intelligence sources and they were tracking bin Laden's escape into the mountains, uh, in the Southeast, you know, which is that area is called Tora Bora. Those they're That's called right. the white mountains. And so Gary was tracking, uh, he was seeing that Osama bin Laden was escaping there and he wanted to send a team down to block his, you know, to, to stop him. That's right. But the special forces guys who were with him, he went to them and they were like, there's no way we're going down south because, you know, that's Taliban territory. And the Northern Alliance tribes that Gary was fighting with, they were just happy to be in Kabul. They didn't, they weren't, they, they refused to go south. So Gary was kind of on his own. And what he did was he got another group of tribesmen, Hazara tribesmen, which was another smaller tribe, to to escort a group of his guys down to Tora Bora. And they went down there, and uh, they engaged uh, 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 Osama bin Laden in, in a battle that went on for, for about 12 days. And... Uh, you know, they were able to get uh, about 40 uh, Delta Force guys to, to, to go down there because what happened was when they got to Tora Bora, there were, Gary was paying off uh, other local tribes to fight for him, but they were very, uh, you know, they, they were not trustworthy at all. And a lot mm -hmm. of them had worked for uh, Bin Laden, you know, like two weeks prior to that or, you know, a month prior to that. So they had, you know, no incentive to really go after Bin Laden. But Gary had, uh, they had brought two of those soflams with them. So they found, they climbed up into the mountains for about two days to a spot where they could look directly down on Bin Laden's camp. And he had a camp in the mountains with about 1,000 to 2,000 people. And they had tanks and barracks and so on. And for 36 hours straight, these few, I think there were four people up there, Americans, they called in airstrikes, and they beat the hell out of Bin Laden's camp. They were, just, right. you know, you know, dropping bombs all about, over the place. About fifty-six airstrikes, right? That's what uh, I read from the CIA. Yeah, it was intense. It was intense. They were dropping bombs all the time. And one of the guys who was there uh, is a uh, uh, was a Lebanese American former Marine, who's you know uh, 
happened to be the guy that the CIA used when they got voice recordings of bin Laden. They would use him to identify bin Laden's voice. And he went down, he climbed down from this, this precipice at, at a certain point, and he saw that there was like a couple of dead Al-Qaeda soldiers there, and one of them was holding a, 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 a walkie-talkie, a push-pull radio. And he grabbed it from the guy's hand, and he started listening, and he heard bin Laden's voice. And bin Laden was talking to his troops, basically saying, you know, praying and saying, I don't know where these bombs are coming from. I don't know how the U.S. found us so quickly. And wow. We have to retreat, you know, up into the mountains. We've got to get out of here. So right away, they knew that bin Laden was trying to retreat into Pakistan. And Gary, for, like I said, this battle went on for about 12 days. Gary was just screaming at Washington, constantly saying, I need U.S. Rangers to parachute you know, into the mountains to stop bin Laden and his men from escaping into Pakistan. And the government, the, the, the military was kind of, their position was sort of like, well, who the hell is this guy? We never heard of this guy before. And how did he get there? And how come, like, a, a, a CIA officer is telling us what to do? You know, right. Calling in airstrikes. And finally, it went to the White House. Uh, the CIA officials took it to the White House and tried to get the president to, uh, you know, they had a big meeting about it. And uh, General Tommy Franks, who was the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said, you know, he was against it. He, was, he said, well, it's very, te you know, it's 14,000 feet, and it's very treacherous terrain, and so on and so forth. And... Uh, um, uh, you know, other people were saying, you know, 14,000 feet, like, you know, I, I, can, I ski at 14,000 feet. Are you, are you feet. kidding me? I mean, come yeah, on, what's right? what's the big deal? These are soldiers. You yeah. know, they're trained to do that. And basically what happened was, at the time, you know, we had this very close relationship with General uh, Musharraf, who was mm -hmm. the head of uh, 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 the president of Pakistan at the time. And uh, he assured, you know, Vice President Cheney, that the Pakistanis would would send troops, you know, to block the border. Right. And, you know, what the government, you know, what the president and the vice president didn't understand at the time was that, that, that those areas were barely under the control of the Pakistani government. They were, you know, they were kind of lawless tribal areas. And what happened was, you know, bin Laden was able to pay off... Uh, Actually, he split his force into two, two sections. He had about 400 guys left. He had taken a very, very serious losses in the airstrikes. And half of them were caught and picked up by the Pakistanis. And they were the guys who, that's why they opened Guantanamo, because they didn't know what to do with these guys. So, but bin Laden was able to you know, pay, his, you know, pay, pay people off at the border and, and you know, and slipped into Pakistan. Wow! So, now, yeah, so it's it, it's, a, it's you know pretty amazing story. It, it is. You know, Gary yeah. was the the CIA's go to guy in Afghanistan for over twenty years. So yeah. I mean, he's definitely a somebody. And yeah. you know, it seems that he's playing this game of cat and mouse with both Bin Laden and the U.S. government. I mean, I read in the book that he tracked down that he that wasn't the only time he tracked down Bin Laden. And he was denied yeah. the use of force against yeah. bin Laden. So, I mean, and then right away when you open Jawbreaker, it looks like your second co-author is a, a black magic marker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had a very difficult time getting the book out. Yeah. It was, wow. it was a tough, tough. Now, uh, uh, it, a lot of things were taken out. And, uh. Yeah, I, I mean, Gary, yes, it's true. Gary was in Afghanistan in 2000 on a mission to uh, to kill bin Laden. And uh, right. he was called out by the Clinton administration because they got, you know, they were cold, they got cold feet. They were worried that, you know, legally at the time, this is before the Patriot Act was had been passed, and, and you know, uh, you know, President Clinton's lawyers basically said, you know, legally we don't have the right, you know, to go into this country and kill this guy. 
And so Gary and his the people who were with him, they tried to they they tried to go ahead. They were planning to go ahead with the mission anyway, because mm-hmm. uh, they were there and they were ready to launch it. So they lied to the government and they were saying, "Well, we can't leave because uh, you know the weather is bad." And finally, people they caught on and they were like, "Hey, look, we're looking at the satellite photos, and you know it's there's no the, there's no bad weather in Afghanistan, so <laughs> you know you guys have to get out of there." But you know this happened. You know, Bruce, this is an interesting thing. You know, this happens a lot in the government. Um, there's oh, there's usually there's a lot of times there's a big disconnect between what people in Wash how people in Washington perceive something. And how people on the ground uh, uh, perceive something. A lot of That's times, right. the people on the ground are way, way ahead of 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 the political leaders, and they're going, uh, you know, this isn't going to work, or hey, this is easy. Just give us the go ahead, and we can take care of this. And people in Washington are sitting around, you know, debating like what the consequences are going to be, or if the time is right and all that. And so a lot of times it's very frustrating for, you know, for people on the ground. I mean, I, I know a lot of, uh, you know, CIA and military people who have been serving in Afghanistan for the last, you know, three or four years. And many of them have described, you know, a situation there that is, you know, really bad. And yet, you know, if you listen to the president or the secretary of state or other government officials, it makes it sound as though, you know, we're we're succeeding in Afghanistan, and that is absolutely the opposite. It's it's not it's not going well at all. Absolutely. I mean, we yeah. we should have learned from the Soviets how that is an impossible battle to win in that terrain. Absolutely. That's the, that's absolutely. their home. That's their home court. And you know, going it's back, their home court, yeah, yeah, and also it's it's uh, as I mentioned before, you know, Afghanistan is a tribal country. All the all the alliances are tribal. It's not about politics. So basically, the government, the the Karzai government, even though Karzai is is the the big tribe in in Afghanistan are the Pashtuns. That's that's the majority tribe, right. and they control most of the south of the country. Uh, the nor- in the north, there are a bunch of other tribes, the Tajiks and the Uzbeks and the Hazaris, but they're much smaller. And the government that is in power now is really the government that, you know, the tribes that we helped install, you know, when, when you know, Gary helped the Northern Alliance uh, overtake Kabul. And uh, so basically, you know, even though it's not described that way by our political leaders, we have taken sides, you know, in a tribal fight. So, and we've taken sides, uh, you know, with the with the lesser, you know, side. The Pasht- the Pashtun tribe, you know, dominates Pakistan and always has. And you know, we call them Taliban. Well, Taliban is sort of their political radical kind of political you know, political military arm, but they represent the Pashtun tribe and the government that we're, rep- that we're fighting for, uh, we're, that we're aiding, it represents the Northern Alliance, uh, tri- the Northern tribes. And, Unbelievable. And, you know, yeah. And, and it's just not going to, it was, it was kind of a flawed, you know, idea from the beginning. And, wow. uh, and the idea that, you know, the Pashtuns are more Islamic than the Northern Alliance is also, you know, uh, uh, you know, flawed. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is not as, uh, you know, as religious, uh, I would say, you know, fundamentally religious country as, uh, you know, a, a lot of the other uh, Muslim countries in the area. So mm-hmm. it's the whole thing has kind of, you know, been mis, you know, misconstrued, you know, right. not explained well to the American people. And sometimes I wonder if the go- if government officials themselves understand, uh, you know, the country, because uh, a lot of them don't. Wow. Now, um, yeah. Ralph, it, it took about 40 days, right, for the agency to get their black mar- markers all over the book. 
Uh, what information is the government mm-hmm. so afraid of in this publication that Gary had to sue the CIA? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting story because um, what happened was when Gary approached me about writing this book, which was in, uh, oh, it was like uh, like about a year before the book came out. So the book came out in December of 2005, and he approached me in like maybe September of 2004, and he, you know, he told me this incredible, you know, that he would have been involved. Actually, when he when I met him, he had been involved in another, uh, like, really spectacular operation in Japan, and he wanted to write a book about that. And I said, yeah, great, man, I, I, I'd love to work with you. And I was walking with him to the train to, he, to get back on the train to go back to Washington. We met in New York, and he said, yeah, after we write that book, I was the guy who was sent into Afghanistan after 9-11, and I had you know, Bin Laden trapped up in Tora Bora. And I grabbed him and, like, pulled him off the train, and I was like, what? <laughs> Tell me wow. about that. And he told me the story, and I said, hey, Gary, that's the book we have to write. You know, and it took me, a, like, a couple of weeks to convince him, and he said, okay, let's do it. And I knew that when we went to sell the book to publishers, that all of them would say, you know, are you going to be allowed to write this book? Because at the time, Gary was still in the CIA. Right. So Gary, and he was planning to stay in the CIA. So Gary, Gary said, okay, I, I raised this with Gary, and Gary said, okay, Ralph, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write, a, a, write up a memo, and I'm going to tell them that I'm, I'm writing a book with you about this subject. He said, because from the CIA point of view, like this is a, a, this is a good story. And I think the the guys, you know, the people that I'm working with will allow me to write this book. And, that you know, and you're like a, you know, well-regarded, you know, balanced writer and so on and so forth. So anyway, he wrote a memo and uh, and they signed off on it. So we went, when we went into publishers in New York and said, hey, we want to write this book about this subject. And they said, well, will the CIA allow you to write this book? We pull out the memo. And then they go, oh, great, you've already taken care of this. So we signed the contract. I started working on the book, and I finished it. And just about the time when I finished it, because any book that's written by a former or current CIA officer has to be, they all sign a contract where the, anything they write during their lifetime about their activities has to be reviewed by they have a, 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 a an office at the CIA. It's called the Publications Review Board. Uh-huh. So Gary and I were just about ready to submit the manuscript to the Publications Review Board, and Gary called me and he said, "Ralph, we might have a problem. Uh, you know, the the there's been a change in the leadership here, and the new director doesn't is really against like any books coming out because he felt he he felt there's been too much." you know, too much information coming out about the CIA. Right. And I was like, well, where does that leave us? And he said, you know, don't worry about it. You know, just go ahead and submit it to the PRB. So we submitted it, and they they came back to us right away, and they were like, hey, man, this is a great book. Uh, you know, we don't really see too many problems here. And we were like, great. Uh, and we were expecting it back, and this was like, say, May of 2005, the book was supposed to be published in, I think, like, 1st of September, and uh, uh, what happened was it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed, and, I, uh, you know, every week, Gary would call the Publications Review Board and say, like, what's going on, and they'd go, you know, we really don't know. Uh, we did our work, and we didn't find any problems in it, but, the you know, the... the uh, guys upstairs are holding it up amazing and and then and gary finally spoke to some of the guys upstairs and they said well it's really being held up by the white house so gary had a friend he 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 knew a guy in the white house and he called his friend at the white house and his friend said gary forget about this book it's never going to come out and at that point that's when gary you know gary is like a very pugnacious type of guy he basically said, you know what, Ralph, screw these guys. 
I'm going to quit and I'm going to sue them because I want, I want this story to come out. And he did that. And, Amazing. Uh, and he won the suit. It, it took a while, but we, we won. And, uh, and, and, and the woman who, the judge was a Republican. So we were kind of nervous about that. And the book finally came out in December, right after Christmas of 2005. But they still, you know, it was like a kind of a, a, a battle. Like every time, uh, you, you know, they would, the first time they gave us the manuscript back, it was like Swiss cheese. I mean, there was no right. book left. They took out so much information. So I had to go through and kind of justify, like, everything that they had taken out and talk, you know, and uh, you know, like write up a little memo about, you know, this passage has been mentioned before because they they have certain guidelines and they had violated all of their guidelines and basically right. and and then by like uh, November we got the last uh, we got the book back again and the publisher was just basically like, you know, we're we're we've, we're exhausted either we publish the book this way. Or you know, forget it. So it was an uphill, an uphill battle from the start. You know, it was an uphill battle. That's right, Bruce. And it you know, a... I'm sorry, but you know what I yeah. take away from this, Ralph, is that the CIA, you know, the president, uh, actually the White House, like you mentioned, it, it definitely seems like they were protecting the Bin Laden family. I mean, after bombing the American embassies that Bin Laden was a part of, I mean, the attack on the USS Cole. I mean, hell, Bin yeah. Laden even received dialysis treatment at a U.S. embassy in Dubai two months before 9-11. So, I mean, all these chances that Gary had to to kill Bin Laden, and he was denied, okay? In the, yeah. in, I mean, he was denied the, yeah. the ability to bag Bin Laden. It's just incredible how instead of sending a death blow to our enemies, we are still, to this day, we see it happening in Syria. We continue to aid and abet them. Yeah, well, Bruce, a lot of times it's just, it's ignorance and it's incompetence. Um, Amazing. There's a lot, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, Syria is another example. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's just a lot of, it's a very difficult situation. Slippery it's, slope. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. And the president, you know, there was never a strategy. I mean, this war has been going on for two years. Uh, I mean, you know, you can go back to the to the Arab Spring. Here were all of these countries that were that were that were you know fighting. You know, the, the populace was rising up against sort of the political repression in their countries, and we were in, we were we were. Encouraging it, uh, uh, the president made you know statements about you know this is a great thing and this is a and a, a democratic movement and an expression of of, of uh, you know people you know seizing you know wanting power back and right. you know overthrowing repressive regimes and you know they overthrew Mubarak in Egypt who had been you know the military dictator for like forty years and they elected a president. Right, they had democratic elections, and they elected a president, Morsi, who was from the Muslim Brotherhood. He wasn't our, you know, he wasn't somebody that we particularly liked. But the Egyptian people elected this guy, right? Right. And then he was he was overthrown by the Egyptian military a couple months ago, and the governments, our government, still refuses to call it a coup d'état, exactly, you know, which is what it was. And Absolutely. even though we didn't like Morrissey, democracy is like a messy thing. We elect all kinds of crazy presidents. Right. You know, now, we don't always elect the, the best the best person or the person somebody else likes, but, you know, that's the way it works. And so, Ralph, uh, yeah. we're, we're running short on time. we got about yeah. two minutes left. I mean, literally, I got... I want to talk to you about so much. You got so many great books, Plunging into Haiti. Yeah, I mean, Eve Missing, Most Evil, the U.S. Navy SEAL Survival Handbook. One of the, I mean, you wrote another book with Gary, I mean, The Walk-In. I mean, I can, yeah. I can talk to you for hours, but I, I don't have the time, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but um, real quick, I mean, you were, yeah. in, you were in Saigon during the Gulf of Tonkin, or better said, 
the lack thereof Gulf of Tonkin <laughs> incident. <laughs> yeah. Tell us, what are I some of the kid. Yeah. right? Yeah. What are what are some of the most interesting places that you've traveled in? And tell us about your book at the Fall of Samosa. Well, my father was uh, my father was uh, a, a, a U.S. diplomat. When he grew up in the Bronx, he was a high school teacher, and then he joined the Foreign Service. And uh, you know, he was a he was a career diplomat. And at the towards the end of his career, he was named ambassador to to uh, he was named ambassador to Uruguay in the seventies. And then when the uh, the Nicaraguan Revolution started in Nicaragua, which was the summer of 1979, he was the, the Carter administration asked him to go to Nicaragua and talk to the president there, who was uh, Anastasio Somoza. His right. family had been in power for 40 years, and try to convince him to negotiate with him to leave Nicaragua. And my father was sent in into the middle of like a civil war in Nicaragua and spent two, two weeks with Somoza in his bunker you know, trying to convince him to leave. And Samosa, who had attended West Point and was like, you know, part American, really, and had all kinds of friends in the U.S. Senate and in Congress, you know, he was basically, and he, he was drunk and on drugs and in, you know, really bad shape, wow. and basically arguing with my father and going, you know, how can you do this to me? I've been a friend of the United States all these years. I've been a anti-communist. I voted for, whenever you told me to vote a certain way in the UN or when you needed bases for the Bay of Pigs, I supplied you with bases. And now in my time of need, when, you know, the people are rising up against me, you know, I, you won't help me. You're telling me to leave. Amazing. <laughs> and so they had this, you know, it was almost like a Greek tragedy, you know, in a way they had this fascinating sort of back and forth that went on for like two weeks while the country was burning. And, wow. uh, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a really interesting book, but, uh, you know, Amazing. just because of my father and the way I grew up, I, I, I've been, you know, exposed and grew up around all these sort of foreign, uh, escapades and crises that, that the U S government has been involved in. And what I, can tell you just sort of as to sum up, you know, as a takeaway from all my experiences going back to when I was like a 10 year old, 11 year old kid in Vietnam, uh, in the sixties and like in the early sixties is that what we do, we make the same mistake over and over again is we get involved in other people's problems that we don't understand. Absolutely. We don't understand the history. We don't understand the culture. It's like I tell people, it's like if you hear your neighbors fighting next door and, you know, they're fighting, you know, every night you hear them screaming at one another and you're hearing, you know, things breaking and so on. And then one day you go, okay, that's enough. And you go over and you knock on their door and basically think that you're going to get in the middle <laughs> of it and straighten it out. It's not, Any not going to work. will tell you that's the most dangerous situation to ever get yourself in. And we do that all the time. Right. Ever. Well, we, we never learn. We well, did Ralph, it in Iraq. We're well, unfortunately, doing it in Syria. Yeah, un yeah. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I hate to cut you off. I mean, no you're, problem, one of, Bruce. you're one of my most favorite uh, authors out there. I got to let you know. Um, I got to bring you back on the show, most definitely. I mean, there's so much I didn't get to cover. But um, quick, Ralph, give, us, give yeah. our listening audience your website and where they can find you. Uh, my website, it's, it's ralphpizzullo.com, uh, R-A-L-P-H-P-E-Z-Z-U-L-L-O. Or, you know, you can look up my books on Amazon, and, uh, you know, I, I, I write uh, both fiction and nonfiction, and they all have sort of foreign themes to them, and, uh, you know, they're pretty, uh, pretty edgy, and uh, I, I think uh, you'll be interested. Yeah. Amazing reads. And, hey, Thank Bruce. It's been a pleasure. I'll come back anytime. Thank you so much, Ralph. We look forward to many, many more great interviews. Thank you.